So thank you very much for uh, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I warmly welcome you to our ABD presentation on strategic mergers and acquisitions for business growth. So today we have with us a team of experts from NDB Investment Bank led by Mr. Darshan Perra. He'll be assisted by head of uh, corporate advisory of the same bank, uh, Ms. Nilendra Veera Singh, and also senior manager, Rukshana Ponso. In addition to the team from NDB, we also have Mr. Hiran Samarasinghe joining from Sunshine Group to share his personal experiences of mergers and acquisitions. So in this audience today, but also I can see in addition to our members, we have uh, quite a lot of students also, since we have opened this for students. So I'm sure all of us, including the students, are going to benefit uh, from the team uh, that we have pulled together here are going to share with us from their personal experiences. This team has a wealth of experience in this subject. So I'm sure we all are going to learn practical insights of mergers and acquisitions today from this team. So before we open the deliberations, let me invite you as the president of CMA Sri Lanka and also being the founder president of CMA to officially welcome the gathering. Good evening to uh, all. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your attendance. I know that there are a number of our maybe participants from foreign countries, actually, I think uh, Nepal, India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, and also from some of the uh, Maldives, uh, where our South Asian Federation of Accountants uh, members are attending. So today we are very happy to uh, welcome all of you. Uh, we have a very, very uh, excellent uh, topic today strategic mergers and acquisitions for business growth. And uh, to make these uh, presentations, we have a very, very vibrant uh, team with us, uh, led by uh, Mr. Jarishan Perra, who's the CEO of the NDB uh, Investment Bank. Uh, they are really the leaders in this area currently. And uh, I uh, saw a news item. So I spoke to Darshan and told him, Darshan, now, uh, why don't you come and uh, join us and have a webinar with us? Because this is a topic that is really uh, which people will like to know. Uh, as uh, Rujira mentioned, uh, it's not only the students, but I think it's uh, for the members, those who are working in the corporate sector, especially in these difficult times where the COVID-19 pandemic is affected. I must congratulate you all because uh, you all have really uh, shown as to how uh, we can meet all these challenges and take uh, the corporate sector forward. So uh, that was uh, the start. And after that, uh, uh, you agreed that uh, we should do this. I know that you're quite busy with various transactions at that time, but you said uh, once the transactions are over, uh, that you will do it. And fortunately, uh, we've been able to meet today uh, with you and your team. And of course, later I've been uh, also communicating with Nilendra and of course uh, he's also been communicating with our staff, Ms. Um, Shanti, and then trying to arrange it. Now, uh, I think uh, Ruchire will maybe uh, give a more detailed description of the NDBIB, but I must say that uh, you all have done excellently well because uh, as the undisputed market leader in investment banking, NDBIB takes pride in the recognition and winning the prestigious Euromoney Award for Sri Lanka's best investment bank. For the 10th consecutive year and remains the first and only investment bank in Sri Lanka to have received this unique award. So uh, I think uh, we are also very fortunate that you and your team are here with us uh, to make this uh, presentation because it's not only our members, there are many from the corporate sector. As I told you, uh, we had a close about, about 700 people who had shown interest, but I'm sure uh, most of them would be uh, uh, logging in and then they would like to listen to you. Uh, I'd like to just to say a few words about uh, CMA also, because some of them are really uh, uh, may not know uh, what CMA is, so may uh, like to know more about what we are doing. Now, CMA is uh, Institute of Certified Management Accountants of Sri Lanka, uh, the professional management accounting body in Sri Lanka incorporated by an act of parliament. So this uh, also makes us the national professional management accounting body. And as you know, the... Uh, uh, main account accounting provision has been chartered accountants. I too, uh, uh, not being only a chartered accountant, but being the president of the institute also. But I've seen that we had a gap, you know, that uh, there are a lot of uh, beneficial areas that uh, management accounting provision had. Because when it was started in the industrial 
uh, with the industrialization, it was really the cost, uh, cost accounting profession because people would not want to know what the cost is, the cost of a product, the pricing of a product, how the expenditure can be controlled, how the productivity could be improved, the efficiency could be improved. So that is something that we really need. Uh, in our country. So I, we thought that uh, this is something that we should have. We are, now we are 21 years uh, incorporated by Act of Parliament. We also have got the recognition uh, from the International Federation of Accountants, which is the global body for the accounting profession, in which all the other accounting bodies are there. So we are also in the same fraternity as any other body, either in the UK or Australia or USA or wherever it is. So it's the same uh, lot that we are all in. So everyone should know that we are also of the same standard and uh, also the same equivalent of everyone. Then uh, we also have the South Asian Federation of Accountants, which is a body for the South Asian region. And I must say, uh, today we are holding the position of the vice president. Now, Mr. Hennaika Bandar, who's here with us, uh, he is the vice president of our CMA and also the vice president of the South Asian Federation of Accountants. So we are also in this uh, very, very important uh, strategic position in the South Asian Federation of uh, uh, Accountants. Then, of course, we have the Confederation of Asian and Pacific Accountants, which is also there for the Asia and Pacific region. So uh, one of the major events that we are organizing and which we have launched now is the CMA Excellence in Integrated Reporting Awards 2021. Now, this is a competition where most of the public quoted companies, the SME sector, the banks, the insurance companies, and all of them uh, uh, participate. And this is supported by the Columbus Stock Exchange. So this shows the importance they have uh, laid down for integrated reporting and also for our award ceremony, which they have been supporting us for a number of years. Last year, although very many did not have anything, we did it uh, online and we are continuing it this year too. So we have the uh, strength of doing these things, you know. So today with these challenges that are there, everything is done digitally from the education to the examinations, to all the transactions with our students and others, we are doing it. So we don't want to deprive anyone of anything. Now, this is another new area that we have started. We have been having numerous uh, webinars of great importance. Now, last week we had one on the, uh, performance-based analysis of uh, uh, which was done by uh, Mr. Gary Cokings uh, from the USA, a specialist in this area. And today we have the uh, uh, team from NDBIB speaking on strategic mergers and acquisition. So uh, just uh, one important thing of the integrated report is that they really highlight the value creation. Now this is something Darshan, uh, Darshan I think that uh, you all are really doing uh, uh, as a as a, uh, a company that is involved in the financial business where you all are creating value. You're creating value to your customers, to your stakeholders, and also to the public at large. So that's a great thing that we are doing. And that's one of the main purposes that we are doing this. So that's something that I thought. But also as professional accountants, some great qualities that we need to instill. You know, One thing is those who qualify would have the support of having our ACMA or FCMA, but also of the highest integrity and of course, uh, maintaining uh, high quality ethics. Now, this is very, very essential. And I'm sure that these uh, really uh, differentiate the professional from some of the others who also should uh, try to come. Now, we have allowed this opportunity to the uh, people in the uh, corporate sector where they can do our exam and become a professional. So we are really not uh, uh, creating this only for a certain sector, but for everyone either for the A-level students, for the undergraduates, for the graduates, and those who are working in the accounting sector, in the corporate sector. So you should uh, recommend this to your staff so that they will be able to uh, get this qualification. And also that this is uh, something that you will use in your workplace if you are really looking today on lean accounting, because that's some of the greater things on your budgeting, on your cost control, on your expenditure control, which are really essential in any business. I think the cost accountant is the person that he will help you in this. So with those uh, remarks, I am indeed once again uh, very happy and uh, I would uh, uh, welcome uh, Darshan and his team, but I'll uh, uh, hand you over to Ruchira to do a brief introduction of our uh, presenters uh, before we start the uh, sessions. Thank you once again, Professor. Uh, so basically as per the agenda, we now have an introductory speech from uh, Darshan, uh, CEO uh, of 
NDB Investment Bank. But before he begins his presentation, let me tell you something about NDB Investment Bank. NDB IB, as we call it, is the market leader for investment banking in Sri Lanka with over 25 years of operating history, offering an array of financial products and services in the areas of debt and equity structuring and distribution, mergers and acquisitions, and corporate advisory services. NDBIB's expertise in providing corporate advisory services includes corporate and balance sheet restructuring, privatizations, diagnostic studies, valuations, as well as feasibility studies. Uh, in addition to what Professor has mentioned about NDBIB winning the prestigious uh, Euromoney Award for 10 consecutive years, uh, they have also mandated, uh, they have also been mandated to carry out two IPOs outside the country, especially in Maldives. Uh, and, uh, Basically, we are privileged to have NDBIB today with us, and also we are privileged to have a team from NDBIB to share the experiences with the audience today. So talking about Darshan, Darshan is the Chief Executive Officer of NDBIP, having over 23 years of experience. He's renowned in the industry as a corporate advisory specialist, specializing in the areas of business due diligence, fundraising, and restructuring. He has been instrumental in leading NDBIB to win numerous international as well as local awards for consecutive years. He has been at the forefront of execution of several large IPOs such as Dialogue Axiata, Lanka IOC, People's Leasing and Finance, Oridio Maldives and Maldives Islamic Bank, as well as the successful completion of numerous mergers and acquisition transactions such as WM, WM Mendis, Unavakna Beach Resort and Bearer Parabut Products. So prior to joining NDBIB, Darshan has held senior management positions in several large organizations and banking institutions. He's an associate member of the Institute of Bankers of Sri Lanka, and also he's a member of Chartered Institute of Marketing. So Darshan, we are privileged to have you with us today. So uh, I, I would want you to now uh, give you opening remarks before we start our deliberations from your team and also with Hiran. Over to you, Darshan. Yeah. So thank you very much, Suchira, uh, for that kind introduction. And uh, I would like to, uh, on behalf of NDB Investment Bank, I would like to thank Professor Watavala, for the founder president of CMA Sri Lanka, for inviting and extending opportunity for us to collaborate with CMA Sri Lanka uh, to conduct this forum on strategic mergers and acquisitions for business growth. In fact, this is not the first time that uh, we had collaborated with CMA Sri Lanka. Uh, sometime in the past also, I have attended some of the seminars uh, organized by uh, uh, CMA Sri Lanka at the invitation of uh, Professor Watwala. So this time around, as uh, Professor said, uh, he had seen some of our recent, uh, recently concluded related transactions on press and then called me and uh, requested us to conduct this session for his membership and for outside parties as well. Uh, with a view to updating uh, on new areas and relevant topics in this uh, current uh, environment. So in fact, uh, m and is an area where activity can be seen in both good times and bad times. So in good times, they are seen companies would want to expand uh, their businesses and would seek opportunities in the market, uh, market to grow. And on the other hand, in bad times, uh, businesses who still want to seek opportunities and acquire companies may be at bargain prices, uh, decent graduations and attractive uh, terms uh, compared to better times. So uh, NDBI as a premier investment bank has seen these ups and downs in the market over the years and will understand the requirements of both uh, the buyers and sellers and are well geared to advise the clients on uh, m and related uh, activity. Uh, today I'm happy to uh, have uh, with us uh, one of our key clients, uh, Hiran Samarasinga from uh, Sunshine Holdings, PSE to share his experience on some of the many transactions embarked by the Sunshine Group in the recent times partnering uh, NDBIB. So thank you, Hiran, uh, for accepting uh, our invitation. So without much ado, I would like to uh, invite Dilenda and Rukshan to make their presentation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you once again for inviting uh, NDB Investment Bank to part uh, CMS Sri Lanka. Uh, thank you, Darshan. Uh, before Nilendra begins his presentation, I think Nilendra will coordinate the panel discussion. So before Nilendra begins that, let me briefly introduce the speakers. So we first have Nilendra Veerasinghe, uh, Head of Corporate Advisory of NDBIB. He counts over 11 years of experience in investment banking. He has been part of the team for landmark mergers and acquisitions, as well as IPO transactions 
and has executed numerous transactions in multiple sectors, including telecommunication, financial services, manufacturing, food and beverages, leisure and agribusinesses in Sri Lanka. And he has done, he has carried out transactions not only in Sri Lanka, but in countries such as Maldives, Bangladesh, as well as in other South Asian countries. He has been involved in the executing of, he has, in, he has been involved in executing over 28 billion in equity capital, raising, and raising over three, thir, 36 billion in mergers and acquisition transactions. Nilendra has also been part of teams which executed key fundraising initiatives via loan syndications and project financing. He's a CFA charter holder and an associate member of uh, Chartered Institute of Management Accountants of UK. So the next speaker from NDBIB is Rukshan Aponsa. He's a senior manager, uh, again, having more than 11 years of experience. He joined the group in 2013 and he has involved in various transactions, including uh, in, in the sectors such as hotels and properties, manufacturing, power and energy and healthcare. So Rukshan specializes in financial modeling, valuation, structuring, m and and equity raising, and counts over 11 years of experience. Uh, he also BS in mathematics and economics from the University of London, and he has completed CFA level two examination. So prior to joining NDBIB, he worked as an associate consultant in corporate finance and strategy division of the PricewaterhouseCoopers. And also we have a guest speaker today. He is from Sunshine Holdings, as Darshan has mentioned. He's Hiran Samarsinga. He's a CFA chart holder, having over 17 years of experience in the industry. He is currently responsible for managing the strategy function of the group, which will support the long-term sustainable growth objectives of the group, including its subsidiaries. And also, uh, he has been a part of the mergers and acquisitions that have been carried out at the Sunshine Group. Uh, he also heads investor relation activities of the group, targeting both existing and prospective investors in both local and foreign capital markets. Right. So now I would like to invite Nilendra uh, to start the panel discussion. Maybe Nilendra, you can now conduct the session. Thank you, uh, Ruchira. A warm welcome to uh, all uh, participants logged in online for this uh, webinar. And also a big thank you to uh, CMA Sri Lanka. Uh, for reaching out uh, to us. It's been a pleasure collaborating with uh, you uh, to share our experiences with um, uh, the participants. Uh, so let me quickly start off with uh, the initial section of the presentation and I, I will then hand over to my colleague uh, Rukshan uh, Aponso uh, and then uh, subsequently uh, Hiran with his uh, wealth of experience uh, having uh, conducted MA transactions on behalf of the Sunshine Group both as um, a buyer acquiring businesses to grow and also uh, as a seller um, uh, to share his experiences uh, for the benefit of the audience. So essentially this presentation is structured in uh, to cover several key topics. Firstly, why m &A? Why should a business consider acquiring or divesting? Um, what are the re reasons behind or the rationale? Uh, the m &A process itself, uh, what what are the stages and steps involved in, in successfully concluding an MA process? And then next, uh, what are the commonly available transaction structures? Uh, ultimately, MA, as in most things, is, is, is about striking a fair balance between risks and rewards between two parties who are negotiating at a table. So, what sort of structures can be uh, made use of are, or are commonly used? Uh, in, in achieving that fair balance between uh, risks and rewards is what this section will cover. Subsequently, uh, we'll talk about roughly um, what sort of parties or stakeholders are involved in, in carrying out an m &A transaction. It will be an exhaustive list. Not everyone would be uh, necessary, but uh, typically uh, the kind of parties who are involved. And, and then what really drives value in, in an m &A transaction? Because we hear of various transactions, we say, certain company has bought another target for so many times their earnings or so many times EBITDA earnings before interest tax and depreciation or so many times the book value. What really drives value? Uh, and and uh, my colleague Rukshan will be going into details there. And then last but not least, I would say the most important and probably often overlooked area in m and that is post-merger integration. Uh, no transaction, however much detailed and due diligence you put into it, 
and, and however much of a strong legal agreement you uh, draft uh, would be successful if not for that last and, and most important piece. So like I said at the start, Hiran, who heads a uh, strategy for Sunshine, uh, comes with a wealth of experience uh, having acquired businesses. So uh, he will be diving deeper into that area to share some of his uh, knowledge and experience with the audience. Moving on to the need for m &A activity. So before, before I go into the reasons, some background thought here. So apart from the reasons that uh, we have thought about based on our transaction experience and listed here, there are a few reasons why not to do an m and For example, uh, and, and, and this is important because unfortunately the frank, uh, if you look at the statistics, uh, majority of MA transactions have not ended successfully. Of course, the ones that were done for the right strategic rationale and for the right reasons with correct process being followed uh, have a much higher probability and likelihood of achieving the goals and being successful. And, and some of these reasons why not to do an MA is just because a target looks cheap or just because there is an abundance of funding, uh, maybe cheap funding right now. Uh, rupee interest rates in Sri Lanka are quite attractive at historic lows and, and cheap funding shouldn't be the primary reason why a, 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 a investor or a company should be acquisitive. Um, uh, and, and, and maybe following your competitors, just, before, just because a competitor made a certain move uh, doesn't mean that, you know, that, that similar move uh, may be suitable to another corporate entity because just like humans, corporates are very unique uh, uh, beings, very unique uh, entities. Therefore, the needs and wants of, of each individual investor or corporate might be different. So, I mean, there's a whole heap of reasons why not to do m and So I'm, I'm not planning to go into depth there, but let's look at, based on our experience, what are the transactions or the right reasons, rationale, that we usually see m and activity happen uh, in the market. And, and also for the benefit of the audience, when we broadly use the word MA, which stands for mergers and acquisitions, essentially we are talking about both sides of the equation, meaning for there to be an acquisition, someone needs to be divesting or selling on the other hand. So essentially it covers both acquisitions and divestitures. All right. So to start with, the most common reason one would consider embarking on MA activity is to scale up fast. And uh, to scale up fast, there can be so many reasons why you want to scale up fast. To start with, it may be simply for a business to add capacity. Uh, maybe you have exhausted your manufacturing or production capacity uh, and you need to uh, increase this capacity to meet surging growing demand. Doing it organically is certainly an option. Uh, selecting a location, deciding whether to buy, lease, getting all the approvals, raising the capital, um, uh, putting up uh, your production facility or factory or plant, uh, importing the machinery, setting it up, commissioning, uh, testing, and then you launch. This, can, this process can take anywhere between probably 12 months on the low side to three, four, five years, depending on what industry we're talking about. So, MA done for the reason of scaling up fast can really add capacity if a company is, is facing a situation of surging demand. So that clearly has been a reason where we've seen uh, transactions uh, happen. Secondly, it can be to consolidate market share. Uh, consolidating market share would mean, say, for example, a company is number three or number four in terms of the uh, hierarchy of market players. And, and maybe by joining up with the second or the fourth player, you can really uh, cross ranks and, and get to the market leader or within striking distance of being the market leader. And, and doing that organically may, may have taken years, if not decades, but MA gives you that boost uh, to get there fast. Uh, thirdly, it can be to gain new customers or markets. Uh, a good example that we've uh, uh, that I can quote, which is in the public domain that we worked out, uh, worked uh, about four or five years ago, is when Hela Clothing, uh, uh, one of the apparel manufacturers in Sri Lanka, 
uh, back in 2015, 2016, when they, uh, they were a European region focused apparel uh, manufacturer and exporter, acquired uh, Foundation Garments, which was a family owned business uh, focusing on the US market and then had a uh, intimate wear focus, whereas Heller was a more uh, leisure and casual wear uh, focus. So essentially through the acquisition, uh, the acquirer Heller Clothing gained access to the US market, to that client segment, to a new product vertical, which was intimate garments. And, and that probably done organically may have taken an unduly or prohibitively long time or may not have been possible at all. So, so that clearly gave them that boost. And then acquisitions can also happen just because you want to buy intellectual property. An intellectual property herein can be a brand, it can be patents, it can be know-how, uh, which is uh, encapsulated within an organization or, or the know-how or expertise with, which is there within a certain senior management team who are working in an organization. And uh, to quote an example, the, the, the big tech industry, Facebook's, Google's, Microsoft of the world, Amazon, they are a very common acquirer for intellectual property. And, and uh, uh, the founder CEO of uh, Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, has been often uh, quoted as saying, we don't buy company for the material in it, but rather the people. Uh, and, and since going public, Facebook has acquired almost over 80 companies, uh, uh, spending over $23, $24 billion. And, and some of those have been for their customer bases or their great following or the brands they have. But most has been just to acquire technology. It may be patents, it may be the employees' uh, uh, know-how or the senior management team's idea or skill set. And then moving across the value chain, you may be a upstream uh, B2B manufacturer. Say, for example, uh, let's take uh, construction materials, aluminium industry. You may be a uh, you may be an extruder of aluminium. Uh, uh, involved in importing billets and then extruding aluminum profiles out of it. And you may want to acquire a downstream aluminum fabricator so that you're more closer uh, to the end consumer of the business. You may be a B2B food and beverage manufacturer, uh, whereas you may be wanting to get downstream to uh, uh, be a more consumer facing brand. And the other, the reverse, vice versa also could apply. You may be a downstream brand, a brand or, or company wanting to secure your upstream value chain and, and hence have a better control uh, over uh, your supply chain and uh, supply chain security. So that, that may be a reason why you want to uh, acquire as well. Moving on to the second strategic rationale, diversification. Now, there is a big debate globally uh, whether a company should diversify or remain a pure play business. Uh, I'm not going to go into the pros and cons or the arguments behind it, but what has been seen globally is that in Asia, we find companies diversifying or preferring to diversify at a corporate level, whereas in the Western world, we find companies growing large and scaling up as a pure play business and leaving diversification to the shareholder level. Nevertheless, so if a company chooses to diversify, uh, it may be because their revenue streams and cash flows are significantly concentrated in certain industries and, and they want to get into new, new areas where the cash flow risks are diversified. Uh, for example, there may be a company uh, which is highly exposed or COVID may be a good example where a company may have uh, realized that most of their uh, sectors in which they are present in are heavily affected by you know, what happened during the pandemic. And if they do have the firepower, the, the, the resources, the funding, uh, they would want to acquire uh, a business where they can use their skills and then achieve some form of cash flow risk diversification. Uh, and, and it may be uh, wanting to gain exposure to a interesting industry or a high growth industry where there is significant potential. Uh, there again, talking about a transaction in the public domain that we concluded uh, RIL recently acquired Pan Asian Power, and, and the strategic rationale there was uh, to get into the renewable energy space where, uh, uh, given the government policy, the world trend, uh, there seems to be a big focus uh, in terms of renewable energy 
increasing the mix of renewable energy generation in, in the uh, energy system in Sri Lanka. And, and that presents uh, a huge gro growth opportunity where a significant capacity uh, can be added to the grid. And then not just locally, but uh, globally, uh, this opportunity is also available. So that can be uh, another example of uh, why diversification may be a strategic rationale for m &A activity. Moving on, it may be portfolio rationalization. Uh, now, this may be the exact reverse of why you did diversification in the first place. Uh, maybe you are right now in mul a, a multitude of business sectors and verticals, and you want to make sure you exit certain non-core segments and, and focus on some of the areas where you think potential is really high. Because after all, as a business, uh, a business which is in multiple sectors, essentially, uh, the managers of a holding company are capital allocators. It's about deciding where the capital of that group would best generate returns for their uh, shareholders. Uh, so as a result of uh, such a study, uh, there may be an instance where a certain non-core segment is diversified, uh, is uh, exited via an M&A transaction so that uh, efforts are focused on uh, uh, the core. Uh, one, one example, again, uh, looking at regional global markets is uh, Citibank recently, a couple of months ago, announced that they're exiting certain markets uh, in Asia that included India, certain markets in Southeast Asia. Now, why they did so was that they felt that the returns uh, uh, of these markets didn't justify the capital that they had deployed. And uh, certain segments, and, and these were not entire market exit, but rather exiting the retail segment of the market in certain uh, of these countries. And they decided, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's time they exited rather than, you know, continuing to generate below par returns in these markets. And then that process is ongoing right now. And it, it has generated significant interest from uh, foreign banks, local banks in those respective markets, and, and it, it is expected to be an extremely hotly uh, bidded uh, M&A process. Uh, so portfolio rationalization itself may be a, a reason uh, uh, for M&A activity. And, and maybe Hiran can touch on that. Uh, within the Sunshine Group, uh, there was a transaction that was uh, executed earlier this year where uh, a certain element of portfolio rationalization within the hydro uh, investments of the group took place where uh, through an m and transaction, hydropower generating assets were divested. So this, this could be uh, another example of uh, that particular strategic rationale. Uh, moving on, uh, the fourth uh, reason uh, in our view can be improving liquidity or shoring up capital. And uh, again, a good example of, uh, of, uh, of uh, I would say, uh, busy period for M&A activity that resulted from shoring up capital liquidity was the post global financial crisis situation. With increased regulation, global banks were required to enhance their regulatory capital levels. The banking business, uh, in fact, in Sri Lanka right now, we have, we've come through a period where banks have gone through significant capital raising to strengthen their capital buffers and regulatory capital requirements. Similarly, post global financial crisis, there was a significant tightening of capitalization levels among banks, and that, that sparked and catalyzed a huge wave of M&A activity, where banks were exiting their securities businesses, their investment banking businesses, in certain markets, their asset management businesses, in, in certain markets, just getting, getting out of the market totally so that they generate liquidity and shore up their capital levels. Similarly, um, uh, I mean, generating liquidity to settle debt if a company is in a spot of bother, over leveraged, distressed in a worst case situation, uh, that, that company might want to sell off what can be sold where there is demand, generate liquidity so that you survive the day to fight the battle uh, later. So, I mean, an example again globally can be, uh, for example, SoftBank, they announced uh, with uh, COVID, most of the uh, uh, private equity investments that they had made in high growth tech companies were going through a spot of bother. And they announced a $14 billion asset sale program, selling businesses and stakes in businesses they held to improve liquidity so that they deleverage and, and get over the 
uh, difficult COVID period. Similarly, there's a private equity group, HNA, in, in China. They were in a spot of bother, heavily overleveraged, having stakes in trophy assets, shopping malls around the world to a significant stake in Deutsche Bank, to uh, private airlines, to all the works. And, and they went through a significant uh, asset sale program through multiple m &A transactions to generate liquidity, deleverage, and, and survive as an organization. So that can be another uh, key reason. Uh, moving on to the fifth and final reason that we uh, have seen spark m &A activity is succession planning. Now, there are two sides of the coin here. Uh, both want the want of succession planning and the lack of succession planning can spark m &A activity. Starting with the former, if a company has built a brand around uh, the, the founder, uh, and, and the founder or the founding family wants to ensure that this brand outlasts the family and the generation, generations to come. Uh, there can be institutionalizing what needs to be done is this brand, the skills, the expertise, the culture of the organization, the know-how needs to be institutionalized within a corporate entity so that it continues uh, you know, in perpetuity, hopefully. And an m &A process may be one step to get there. I mean, we've seen founder-led organizations successfully doing that in Sri Lanka. And, and if I may quote an example, Odell is a, is a beautiful example where the founder really institutionalized uh, what was initially envis envisioned as a founder into a corporate entity, which is uh, Odell, uh, right now listed as Odell TLC. And later through MNA, uh, it's it's now part of the SoftLogic group. So. The name lives on, the brand is growing and, and reaching greater heights. And that's a beautiful example of uh, MA being one part of the overall succession planning process. And then secondly, lack of succession planning itself can trigger MA. For example, if there are difficulties in making the generational transition, there may be founders whose, whose uh, children have uh, settled overseas, are, are pursuing careers of their own, or, or are motivated uh, to go on their own entrepreneurial journey and start from scratch, who are not interested in re really taking the mantle and, and continuing the business. And, and that may be, and that we have seen in our experience, including a couple of transactions that uh, was closed last year, has been a significant driver for m &A activity. Uh, and, and as a result, you'll find a, a, a corporate entity or maybe even another family-owned organization seeing value in what has been built and then acquiring uh, uh, this business. So these are, these are what, what I would summarize as five key strategic rationale or drivers that create the need for m and activity. With that, uh, let me hand over uh, the rest of the presentation to start off with the m and process and take it uh, through to the end. Uh, Rukshan, over to you. Thanks, Lendra. So moving on to the m &A process. So naturally when there's an m &A process, you'll have a sell side and a buy side as well. So in the sell side, generally, if you're working for some divesting shareholders uh, who's looking to sell a subsidiary or maybe a part of the business, uh, that would be essentially the sell side. And of course the buy side, uh, if I'm to touch on what Nilendra mentioned, if you are trying to scale up, diversify, improve, improve liquidity and so on, uh, and you want to, buy an entity or a business, uh, essentially that will be the buy side. So uh, what I'm trying to do here is run you through the process, the MA process and as advisors, what we typically kind of recommend and what we do uh, for, let me start with the sell side. So number one is the m &A prep work that we do and that's the housekeeping work. And here it could involve certain steps like making sure your books are in order, your systems are ready for inspection and making sure that the sellers themselves do have a long-term business plan so that that can be presented to the buy side as well so that in the seller's view, how the, you know, the financial statements would look like and what kind of value that can be generated from the business. So at least from a seller's point of view, uh, we should have some of those business plans and that's where sometimes we get involved and we help them to derive those plans, of course, uh, with their expertise. 
and on secretarial matters like certain uh, legal documentation like uh, maybe shareholders or interest re registered have they kept board minutes etc etc and another thing that we very closely look at is uh, key agreements uh, if i may take an example uh, say you're a family owned business this is typically in family owned businesses that we see this uh, say you're a family owned business and you've been dealing with a certain principal for may, maybe 25 30 years and the relationship uh, with that principal principal is so strong i mean you know them very well they know your families they you know each other very well so given the strength of that relationship you might not think of renewing any particular agreements that you may have with them. Now, in an M&A transaction, from an outsider's perspective, yes, you do have that relationship, but from an M&A perspective, from a buyer's perspective, uh, the buyer would see this as a significant risk when taking over the company. So it's always important to have your contracts up to date. And uh, again, uh, there are certain ways of kind of mitigating the dependency on the print, on the the promoters themselves which we'll talk about later in when we're uh, structuring the transaction so essentially in the m a prep work that we do these are some of the key items that you look at and the company should be mindful of these and next step number two we look at uh, preparing the transaction documents uh, so that could be from a teaser an iem an nda and even the valuation model uh, if i may start with the teaser a teaser is a uh, basically a document that we send out on a no names basis uh, and it's generally widely circulated and it's used to generate interest and once you've generated that interest certain investors who are keen in this opportunity will want additional information and that that's when we sign non disclosure agreements with them and take and share additional information with them and part of that additional information would be an information memorandum. So the information memorandum would talk about, it will talk about the company, its capabilities, the assets, uh, the staff, and even the competitive landscape. And of course, the financial forecasts, uh, which will for, uh, form an important piece of that uh, IM. And then again, there'll be a valuation model as well. And this valuation model uh, basically will be developed with the assistance of the manager, uh, or with, with the management and in that sense with there'll be financial forecasts and certain assumptions that are driving those forecasts and that will be kind of like uh, input to the IM as well. So if you move to the next stage which is the valuation and transaction structure the valuation model that we build will be utilized for this and there'll be multiple iteration multiple discussions with the divesting shareholders on the valuation range so the shareholders might have a particular range in mind uh, we might put some of the numbers some of the plans into valuation model and see how justifiable uh, uh, the expectations are if they are not we might have to look at the numbers and tell them look this might not be a practical uh, practi practical number given the approach uh, given the assumptions and and the outlook for the company so that is again where we get into math uh, discussions with the divesting shareholders and we come up with a valuation range and then similarly valuation structure again there can be multiple structures we can we'll be talking about that later but it could be a hundred percent uh, divestiture you might want to divest hundred percent of the shares or you might want a phase out exist eg exit sorry phased out exit so where you'd be also involved as a minority shareholder maybe in the part uh, as part of the business and eventually you will divest that uh, that stake as well uh, next we move on to the designing and agreeing on the distribution strategy so i mentioned earlier that we circulate a teaser now before we do that generally we speak to the divesting shareholders and we have a conversation on who we should approach and the seller might have a couple of uh, reservations or what we like to call a negative list where they might tell us don't approach certain parties. I mean, if I'm to give an example, maybe uh, 
they might say don't approach our competitors uh, the products we have the intellectual property that we have uh, it could be very sensitive and even through the mna process if that information gets out to a competitor uh, it might end up in hampering the business so there'll be a negative list there where the sellers have their reservations on uh, being approached and then there is a type of investor that we approach is it a strategic investor or is it are, are they financial investors generally strategic investors uh, come with experience expertise and they they know the business as well and they'll generally want to acquire either 100% or a majority stake in the business whereas financial investors might have certain experience but in in comparison to strategic uh, investors uh, they might have limited exposure to the business and they'll usually come with maybe a significant minority stake maybe they'd acquire 30% of the business and then look at eventually learning the business and moving to a controlling or a 100% stake and generally what we realize in terms of financial investors is that they might not initially be willing to pay high premiums for the company given their unfamiliarity with the business and then we move on to the non binding of a stage so this is where we invite all these investors who have shown interest uh, in the transaction to submit their initial offers so we call this a non binding offer and through this process and through these non binding offers what we hope to kind of identify is what is their opinion on how much our business is worth and what kind of say what kind of transaction structure that they need do they want us to sell 100% out immediately or is it another transaction structure that they're looking at uh, what are the key concerns they have on our business and maybe the due diligence requirements and what kind of timing that is required to carry out the due diligence and also another thing that uh, we would particularly ask generally if we are managing the process is what is your capacity to finance this acquisition so if you look at a large conglomerate uh, you generally have uh, no hesitation in kind of assessing their capabilities to kind of finance an acquisition but say hypothetically there is a consortium of investors who are maybe depending on bank borrowings and so on uh, we might want to know what the status of that funding is and what their capabilities are so here what you don't want is to take an investor through this mna process and at the end of it to find out that uh, they might not be able to pay for the acquisition or they might not have their funding in place so that that is another critical element that we try to assess at this non binding of a stage moving on to number 6 the investor short listing and signing of term sheets so basically we have now in the process received all these binding offers from multiple invest multiple investors uh, in a recent transaction that we did we collected over 10 non binding offers and we had to go through a short listing process there as well and again uh, pricing would play a key role in in short listing an offer but however there is importance or certain importance is placed on other consideration as considerations as well uh, especially in terms of uh, transaction structure and so on so apart from pricing there are certainly other elements of these offers that would be important when it comes to short listing uh, the final investor list so in terms of short listing ideally in a process we might short, depending on the offers or the 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 value of the offers or the range of offers we might we might select maybe one party or maybe multiple parties to go to the next stage and give them the opportunity to do a further study or a due diligence into the company so that's where we sign a a term sheet with them get into some form of agreement and then typically we move on to number 7 which is the due diligence stage so here usually the seller would have a physical or virtual data room that is where all the information with regard to the target is uh, being collated i mean 
transactions now are moving more towards physical data rooms, uh, sorry, virtual data rooms rather than physical data rooms. And I think the time where we did have physical data rooms uh, is long behind us right now. So there'll be a virtual data room generally, and there are good third party uh, vendors who provide these services as well. I mean, you can naturally do it uh, through one of your internal systems as well, uh, SharePoint or whatever that you might have in your company, but there are third party vendors as well who will provide these at a cost, obviously. And uh, some of the security features are really good so that there won't be uh, data that is misplaced or you might not be able to download some of the documents you might only be able to read it on your screen there will be certain watermarks in the documents so there are some security functions that these virtual data room uh, providers also have so uh, again at a fee you can uh, get one of those uh, providers as well and uh, from the buyer side this is where they appoint Generally, they would appoint external DD parties, due diligence parties. Uh, very rarely do we see internally that the due, uh, the due diligence being done, but in some instances we do if then there's, when there is capacity within that organization. But however, typically the financial tax legal due diligences, they are outsourced and uh, carried out by external due diligence partners. And while I said typically financial tax and legal due diligence uh, plays a big role, there are also some instances where people have done HR due diligences, maybe IT systems and so on. So once the due diligence is done, the DD parties will in fact issue their report, their draft report, uh, and then they will highlight any red flags, essentially any issues that are there with the company or with the target. So this is where we again get into negotiation or discussions rather with the uh, DD partners, the DD partners or the sellers, the buyers, we all investment bankers all get together and we discuss these and we negotiate and agree on a certain way forward on how to address this. And then we move on to what is called the binding of a stage. Now a binding offer is a more definitive offer uh, so the buyer will generally include whatever adjustments that they uh, have in terms of pricing. So they would give a non-binding offer and then they'll do the due diligence. And if there are some material findings, they might adjust that non-binding offer price with those findings and they will give a binding offer price. And of course, it's from, from the seller's point of view, it's important to understand how critical and how material those adjustments are. So based on that, there might be further discussions or maybe you might share additional information with them to give the buyer additional comfort or propose uh, certain enhancements through legal agreements uh, when we come to the final stages of the transaction. So how we end that stage off is say, had we appointed a single party, we'd go through that, uh, had we, shortlisted a single party we go through that process and we take that party to the final uh, negotiating table or if we have multiple parties we might negotiate discuss with all those parties and make a selection of one particular investor to go in as the final uh, as the final uh, selected uh, investor to go ahead with the transaction so that is stage nine, we are, select the, we are selecting the final investor and we go move on to negotiations. And then of course we move on to stage number 10. So that is the final leg of the transaction process. So that's where we start drafting the legal agreements, whatever we've agreed on earlier and what we've negotiated on, especially in terms of uh, transaction structures and so on. So after the legal agreements are drafted, we move on to signing the legal agreement. Uh, and the legal agreement could be in the form of a share purchase agreement or maybe an asset transfer agreement, again, depending on what you're selling. Uh, so once you sign the agreement, it doesn't necessarily mean that the transaction has come to an end or the transaction process has come to an end. Uh, 
there are certain clauses which in legal agreement is referred to as conditions precedent where the buyer buyer or rather the seller will have to fulfill or the seller and the target together will have to fulfill certain conditions that have been set out in that agreement by the buyer so the seller will have a period between signing and essentially closing the transaction where they will be fulfilling some of these terms and conditions set out in the legal agreement after those conditions have been met and after the buyer has agreed that these conditions have been fulfilled we will move to closing the transaction so when we close the transaction that is where if it's a cash transaction the cash is transferred or any other form of uh, consideration and the shares are also being transferred to the buyer so some transactions uh, we see that the signing and the closing do happen on the same day so sometimes the the sell side proactively during the negotiations they do fulfill some of the conditions that uh, they foresee that will come in so because of that we are able to kind of sign and close the transaction on the same day if i move to the buy side uh, essentially i mean there are a lot of uh, similarities here so let's say in a situation where hypothetically the, the target has already been identified and the buy side appoints an advisor then the process is essentially following whatever that has been set by the sell side of course but guiding the buy side or the buyers in terms of negotiations and so on so if you look at the bottom part of this list uh, list is essentially the same thing but you'll be following the process that has been set out for you by the sell side so as investment bankers we take the responsibility of if you are on the buy side on advising them again on valuations uh, on structures maybe uh, on the non binding offers and of course definitely on the negotiations as well now if 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 someone comes and says that they want to diversify they want to let's take an example of someone says they want uh, to acquire some assets in the energy sector renewable energy sector so as an investment banker if they do come to us uh, so they have not identified a target but they come to us so in in that instance there'd be an initial kind of objective setting setting transaction parameters and a screening process where we look at the potential targets that are out there i mean based on some other relationships that we've developed over time we might know of some companies that are up for sale so uh, that's where we do essentially the screening and then run through a similar process afterwards uh, one final thing i think uh, was touched on in the introduction as well is the post merger integration and that is something that hiran also will touch on later that is something that the buy side needs to critically look at it's it's not a mat matter of going through the process i think post merger integration is essential for the success of any m&a transaction so that becomes the final piece there becomes in our opinion the most important piece of uh, this entire puzzle moving on uh, we we'll look at some uh, transactions so i can focus your attention on that uh, uh, initial line there that uh, we put so the objective is generally through an mna transaction by structuring our object is to share the risks and rewards of the transaction in a fair and equitable manner you'll understand the meaning of the statements i think once we run through a couple of the transactions uh, transaction structures uh the first one let's look at uh the simplest one are we offering cash or is it for shares and uh, let me explain that so the divesting shareholders can be offered both cash or shares or even cash and shares now when i say shares uh the buyer could be operating in a certain business and those shares would have a certain value maybe the buyer can swap those shares with the seller uh for this uh for the shares in the target company so essentially sharing the risks going forward of the combined businesses of both the buyer and the seller so and also there's a combination of uh, that as well so 
if I'm to quote an earlier example, with Nilendra also mentioned the foundation garments and Hela transaction. Uh, there, essentially, the consideration was in two forms, both in cash as well as in the form of shares. And also, here we look at how much of the company that you do want to acquire. Are you acquiring 100% upfront? Or is it a 50% stake or a 51% stake or a 75% stake with a path to control? So that would depend somewhat on your circumstances as well. Say, for example, if you're acquiring a competitor, you are well-versed and familiar with the business. So you'd ideally want to immediately acquire 100%. If you have the capacity to do so, you would ideally immediately acquire 100%. And you would not need the support or a minority shareholder being there. And in certain cases where the buyer is not familiar with the business that uh, they are acquiring. Say, for example, if they are looking to maybe diversify, it's one example. So they might acquire a 20 to 30% initially and have a path to 100%. And, and this structure is actually especially during the COVID environment as well, has been very popular globally, where investors acquire a small stake, maybe 20, 30%, like I mentioned. And they, there's a learning period in which they learn the business, learn the industry, learn the ways of, learn ways of how things are happening. And eventually, they would set themselves apart to acquire a controlling or a 100% stake. And certain other elements of this could be depending again on the bargaining power of each party. If there is a minority shareholder involved post acquisition, uh, there could be a put option where a seller <coughs> has the right to sell shares at a pre-agreed price. So in a future date, the seller might, might say, okay, I want to sell my shares now. I have agreed on this particular price I, or I have agreed on this particular performance-based multiple and, and the buyer will be obligated to buy those shares. And similar, similarly, if the buyer negotiates their way to an option, which would be a call option, they would have the right to buy the shares on a future sort of a pre-agreed valuation and or a performance-based multiple. So that would be a couple of years or a couple of years after the acquisitions. So so that being said, there are certainly other ways as well that this consideration can be offered. There could be deferred cash settlements. So you might not pay 100% upfront. You might hold back some of the component of the consideration to pay later. So there are certain ways that you can stru uh, structure this transaction. And... One of those is a phased out acquisition or a divestiture. So here is where when you get into, it's, it's, it's a part of what I earlier covered as well. Uh, it's a part of that. It's a subset of that so where the seller will be more accountable for the performance of the business and have control over the PNL of the company going forward after the acquisition has happened. So here the seller might hold maybe a minority stake or there might be other agreements which ties the seller to the performance of the company. So here you'd essentially structure the payouts which happen in the future for that minority stake based on, again, a, could be a formula or some kind of uh, performance-based uh, multiple or so on. And in the event, uh, some of these structures coming to play, <coughs> sorry, some of these structures come into play. There are certain minority protection rights that uh, these uh, sellers might request. One is they might need a both seat. Uh, they might request for right to information, certain rights to information. They might request for right to veto certain decisions uh, that could impact that the stake that they are that they are retaining. I mean, it could something that could maybe of dilutive in nature. And also there'll be rights like uh, tag-along rights. So uh, if I can explain that a bit uh, further. So say I acquire 70% of a company and this minority shareholder is there who owns 30%. Uh, now say in a couple of years that the major shareholder who bought the company earlier wants to, wants to divest the company again. 
This is the second round of divestiture. So in that sense, the minority will be protected by, by getting a tag along right where essentially they have the right to, as the word says, to tag along with the major shareholder when selling, uh, selling out to an external party. This is to avoid, I mean, be stuck with someone that uh, you might not be familiar with and with a minority stake uh, with a whole new party. Next, we move out to earn out mechanisms. Uh, this is essentially uh, a mechanism to sort of bridge the gap in valuation when, uh, when there's a transaction happening. Say, for example, the, ta the target might think or the, or the buyer might think that the target would perform in a certain way uh, based on whatever industry analysis, whatever experience that uh, the buyer has. And the seller might have a completely different view. And how do we sort of bridge this gap so that difference in view would res result definitely in, in a difference in pricing or difference in valuation? So how do we bridge that gap? What we do to bridge that gap is we, we say, okay, we will buy at this valuation, which is a lower valuation to the seller's expectation, but we'll give you the opportunity to get an additional payment if certain KPIs are achieved in the business. So that is essentially a earn out mechanism where the sellers are compensated for better performance post acquisition. Retention bonuses. Again, this is something that is quite popular in the overseas uh, market. So this is very much in relation to key employees of a company. Say, for example, you buy 100% of a company and all those customer relationships, the supplier relationships, the know-how are with some certain key employees who have been driving this business. Now, once you acquire the company, if these employees leave or if they walk out the door, you'd be left with basically a paper company. So to protect yourself from that, you would offer certain incentives to key employees so that they remain in the business and they continue to drive the business. And of course, this payments can be structured in multiple ways. It can be an upfront lump sum bonus or it could be like a staggered, a piecemeal uh, payment, or it could be even KPI based. Say you achieve certain, certain numbers, the management will be compensated or those key individuals will be compensated accordingly. And if I can uh, quote an example there, in 2016, uh, Virtusa bought an Indian company named Polaris. And in this transaction, there was a significant amount that was set aside for, if I'm not, uh, I think uh, three key individuals in the transaction. So these individuals have been driving the business and obviously as an acquirer, Virtusa saw the value and they set aside uh, a significant amount uh, as an incentive scheme for these key employers. Moving on again, uh, escrow holdback and clawback mechanisms. So these are, risk mitigation strategies uh, adopted by the acquirer to avoid uh, certain conti contingent liabilities uh, that could uh, materialize in the future and also which has come to their attention during the due diligence process. So for example, uh, maybe certain tax liabilities, maybe you have not paid the relevant amount of income tax. Maybe there's a huge tax bill that you have underpaid taxes. So certain liabilities that could come in the future. So these are some of the strategies that are used to kind of mitigate that risk and make sure that the seller is accountable for whatever practices or whatever, uh, whatever actions that have happened before the acquisition date. So one such mechanism is this escrow mechanism where uh, the buyer deposits part of the purchase consideration in a separate account, escrow account, and that would be released to the seller upon you know meeting certain milestones or fulfilling certain objectives or when such a risk has been cleared. And also again, a holdback, which is essentially you not paying the full amount of purchase consideration again until some of those risks are cleared. 
And also in some instances where the probability of risk is fairly low, uh, we could request for what we call indemnities in the legal documentation. And also maybe look at if there are subsequent payments, say for example, if you're buying back, uh, uh, if you initially bought 70% and you're buying back a 30% later, you could deduct that payment from that 30% if some of these liabilities, uh, liabilities arise. And also, you, uh, also there can be clawback mechanisms where you essentially ask back or is, there's a mechanism set in place so that you can get back some of the money that you have initially paid as purchase consideration. Uh, moving on to the final one in trans terms of transaction structures, uh, looking at a share versus asset acquisitions. So there can be instances where you don't acquire the shares of the company, you acquire maybe the assets. Uh, so one of the instances that comes to mind there is say in, in, in a situation where the company is distressed, the company, you might not want to associate yourself with the shares of that company, but you might see certain value in those assets that that company holds. So in, in that, in that sense, you might want to structure the transaction as an asset purchase as opposed to a share purchase. And also, I mean, assets need not be physical assets. There could be instances where you acquire maybe only a brand, only some intellectual property, a patent, so on, maybe a particular strategic business unit of a company. Uh, and those are the instances maybe you wouldn't want to burden yourselves with owning the shares of that particular company. And typically when there are no such circumstances, you would look at a share acquisition, uh, which is predominantly the mode of transaction that we see in the market. But however, we'd see a lot of asset transactions as well in some of those situations that I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> so, Looking at all these transaction structures, so there are multiple ways to, trans to structure it and it, it's good to proactively think through some of these when you're structuring or looking at uh, basically sharing the risk of a M&A transaction. Uh, so sometimes in the public domain, you see an M&A transaction that has happened and immediately, myself included, we might say, oh, look, they might have, uh, looks like these guys have play paid a rich multiple for the transaction, or you, some might say, oh, this looks like a good bargain. But what you see in the public domain is very limited. And what happens behind closed doors is essentially some of these stru structuring mechanisms where certain risks are priced in different way. So to get a fair grasp of the pricing of the transaction, it'll be wise or to make a fair judgment, we'd need to look at some of these structures that uh, maybe the buyer and seller have put into place. Moving on, uh, looking at the parties to an M&A transaction. So let me start again with the sell side. So obviously there are the sellers or the divesting shareholders and there'll be the shareholders divesting the shares of the target company. And a, a seller or sorry, a seller might appoint an investment banker a seller might appoint an investment banker to kind of uh, uh, advise them through the process and part of that process that I mentioned earlier. And also from the seller's perspective, there may be, there may be, uh, uh, there will be in fact uh, lawyers so it could be internal teams or it could be external, external legal advisors as well. Uh, and uh, moving on uh, on the buy side, again, there is the buyer, the acquirer, and then the acquirer might uh, appoint an investment banker. And again, they might have lawyers in their run. Uh, they, will have, they will have lawyers, uh, could be internal or external. And of course, they'll appoint the due diligence partners. And Essentially, an investment banker's role, if you're taking from the sell side, they'll liaise with all the parties and form a bridge between the buy side as well as the sell side. Uh, 
and also there are other parties like auditors banks in case that the if the seller is using or the buyer is using leverage uh, company secretaries and consultants and so on so key value drivers in terms of a very important uh, uh, piece of the puzzle so here again number one uh, what are you buying as and selling it's very important for you to identify what are you buying is it a brand patent is it market leader, leadership and a strong consumer following uh, is it a manufacturing facility and so on and so forth so you need to be aware of what you are buying or selling moving on uh, the past and future growth trajectory so how has the company grown in the past and how has the company and how what are the prospects of the company to grow in the future and you might look at it in comparison with the industry so i mean the industry might have certain dynamics uh, within it i mean it could be a sunset in sunset industry it could be an industry that has a lot of competitive pressures margin pressures and so on so you might want to look at all of this uh, when making an acquisition and again the financial health of the target how much leverage that is being used uh, is it sustainable can the debt be serviced uh, obviously a fine a company been with good financial health will have a more <coughs> negotiating ability uh, as a seller if you are selling a company with a company uh, that has good financial health the quality of uh, financial statements again so that's very important because that will be the primary source on how the financial performance is read and kind of interpreted so because of that the quality of financial uh, statements the integrity and the integrity of the systems have proper books been maintained all of that uh, is uh, and are there any audit opinions or qualifications all of that are very important in terms of uh, key value drivers and next in terms of management strength now this is a very important uh, piece uh, this is where you need to identify is the promoter actively driving the business or is there independent management who can handle this company without the help of the promoters so again having independent management will be a significant uh, uh, value driver here because whoever comes in might not have to rely on the promoter and it makes the transition much more smoother and moving on uh, post merger synergies again here is where we look at that elusive formula of making 1 plus 1 equals to 3 uh, where we bring in certain efficiencies could be production based distribution or maybe on brand spend or even on economies of scale yeah example there'll be large procurement uh, and you are in the same industry so you might let me be certain economies of scale there so in in highly competitive transactions we've seen some of these synergies being passed on as well so it's important as a buyer or as a seller to identify what kind of synergies there are for a buyer and that would be actively used when coming into the negotiating table uh post merger integrations i will not spend too much time on this because uh, hiran uh, will take over uh, most of this uh, from of a practical angle and post merger integration is probably the most important part of the business it it, it up to now it's just a process uh, that has been carried out but irrespective of how comprehensive your due diligence is how how you adjust uh, pricing to manage some risk going forward how much of protections that you built into the certain legal documentation it will all be somewhat irrelevant if you cannot manage uh, the post merger integration so you need to have a clearly defined purpose strategy and effectively manage the integration process and a couple of key points there is to maintain the momentum of the on ongoing business uh you don't want to uh, have too many disruptions there to maximize and accelerate synergies and value creation so initially you marked out certain synergies by buying this company now it's time to action that and make sure that that shareholder value creation is generated and then uh build the organization and align the cultures to drive the new company forward so this is where i think it's very important where you actively engage 
the employers of the business have a very employees of the business have a very transparent process and make sure that everyone is engaged towards reaching, reaching a common goal and also you might as a buyer you might have some of your own processes so you might not want to implement that on day one there could be a phased out approach where you bring in some of the processes and the efficiencies in a phased out manner and of course finally using the combined capabilities to advance the company's competitive position uh, i think so once you have acquired a business you are now a bigger and possibly better organization so how you drive that to gain ahead of the competition is another important aspect of the post merger integration so that brings to an end our section of uh, the presentation and i'd like to hand it over to hiran to take you over the post merger integration part of it thank you uh, ukshan and uh, good evening ladies and gentlemen uh, uh, i'm hiran samar singh heading uh, uh, strategy for sunshine holdings uh, for the benefit of uh, the foreign participants i would like to uh, uh, give some color on sunshine holdings uh, we are listed uh, conglomerate in sri lanka uh, predominantly uh, focusing on areas such as healthcare uh, consumer goods and agri business uh so uh, during the uh, last couple of years uh, we have done multiple m and a transactions uh, we have been both on the sell side and the buy side in multiple uh so uh, to talk to you a bit about on the buy side and then the pmi process the post merger integration process uh, uh i would like to uh, Uh, do that by sharing some practical examples that I have gone through personally uh, when integrating these companies that we bought in to our corporate culture. So uh, I start with a small cartoon. Uh, you must be seeing this box, which is upside down, same merger. Uh, so I think this is the usual scenario after like the second, first or second day of the merger after signing. Uh, where the uh, team, uh, both the acquiring team and the target team, trying to figure out the pieces and how to put it together and integrate. So two days ago, this box was nicely wrapped. It was like upright, and now it is in a chamber, uh, upside down. Uh, so those are the challenges, and uh, we have on uh, post merge integration, and uh, how you should address those is what we are going to discuss today. uh ukshan can you jump so basically uh, to sum up some of the key issues that come up uh, in uh, post merge integration i'll stick to pmi uh, 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 because it's shorter uh, in pmi one of the biggest issue is culture uh, the culture of the uh, acquiring company and also the culture of the target company uh, sometimes you think you might think uh, culture is different between india and sri lanka that's obvious but uh, my experience is culture is different between kolpiti and ratmala uh, so we acquired a company confectionery company in ratmala uh, the culture was completely different and uh, in terms of uh, power distance and how we make decisions and how we trust each other like is it uh, is the trust based on uh, task if you do a task properly then you trust that person that's uh, they they are culture was uh, if you know if you've been working there for 30 years then you are trusted so in that sense there were a lot of cultural gaps and uh, the important thing is uh, you have to be mindful uh, when engaging uh, on the pmi process uh, the second one is uh, what i call prestige power versus responsibility so uh, this also comes to play in both acquisitions and mergers so in Uh, mergers uh, you might have a situation where there are might be multiple ceos uh, we had a situation like that and then who who comes on top and who who's the big boss is a good big question you need to answer and also responsibility so sometimes uh, at the initial state of the pmi process there might be a person who is the ceo who has the power and prestige but the actual person working and doing the job to make the integration work the responsibility lies with someone else 
so the pmi process should uh, slowly uh, uh, match this and make this a single person going forward uh, for the pmi process to be a success uh, the third one of the big ones uh, in terms of the targets uh, employees target companies employees is job security salary and benefits so, like a basic question that they need to answer so some of the questions they answer ask is uh, what will happen to me what will happen to my salary uh, what will happen to my boss and end of the day who will i report to so uh, these are some of the big questions that will come up in the target companies employees and you will have to manage those uh, very carefully uh, in terms of uh, communicating and uh, uh, resolving those issues for effective pmi process so uh, in this situation uh, over communication is key i think uh, uh, but from what i have experienced you have to communicate the same thing more than five times for them to uh, uh, understand and get it because you have to uh, understand their situation they are in a lot of stress because there's a lot of change happening and uh, a lot of issues going on so you have to over communicate to get the message across uh, and the fourth one i want to talk about is systems and processes so sometimes there are complete mismatches uh, in systems and processes to give you some examples between uh, us the acquiring company and the target our files our systems and uh, processes are all in a cloud uh, the systems that run on a cloud uh, you don't even have a server room. whereas their systems and their files are in a paper file in a cabinet file behind the ceo's desk so that's a huge difference Uh, how do we apply for leave we do it through online hris system where the approval process is through the system itself but they do is they do a chit and give it to their supervisor or manager and uh, another example is the accounting system ours run on uh, ifs erp whereas their accounting system was based on a big excel file so there are multiple uh, issues like that which you need to slowly but surely uh, Uh, convert uh, towards the acquiring company to make the PMI uh, 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 successful. Dukshan, uh, if you can skip to this one, thanks. So uh, uh, this is something that I've, uh, from uh, my personal experience, I've put out something that might uh, put this process in a structure. Uh, the four steps of integration. So first uh, step. is defining the integration approach so the approach uh, depends on two key factors one is the business mod model interdependence and uh, the within, uh, organization's uh, autonomy need uh, to uh, just stress on that first point uh, business model interdependence uh, this is how intertwined the two operations are say for example uh, when we bought the confectionery company uh, Uh, the distribution was common, and we saw a lot of synergies there. So the interdependence was high. So then, obviously, uh, we go for a very aggressive uh, integration uh, program rather than a program if it's completely unrelated to business. Say uh, a healthcare business took over a renewable energy. There's nothing connecting those. So then, there's no hurry to integrate it because it's two separate businesses, and there's no interdependence. Again. Uh, moving on to the second sub point organization autonomy so this is also do with the organize uh, target uh, organization's culture do we need to safeguard the uh, target's culture to get the value out of it so i think this is mainly relevant for like uh, high uh, tech companies where the uh, uh, culture of innovation is a very valuable thing and sometimes the acquisition is driven by those uh, uh, in innovative uh, cultures so then you don't you touch the you don't necessarily touch that culture you leave that target to uh, run autonomously whereas it's a similar business uh, say uh, uh, our healthcare business took over another healthcare business it's the same business same customers uh, uh, similar principles so we just put it together fast uh the second is integration planning so this is one of the most important part of the uh, uh mna process uh, before closing the transaction 
from a buyer side, buy side. So what we do is we come up with a plan. Uh, we have a we usually have a detailed plan on who is doing what. Uh, so uh, we allocate this, uh, we list down all the things that need to be done, and it's essential for us to put a name uh, alongside that task. Otherwise, uh, when the deal happens, there will be nobody to take it on. So those should be pre-arranged, and uh, usually those plans, uh, as per our corporate governance structure, when we go for investment committee approval for any deal, we have taken uh, take the integration plan as well and give them confidence that okay, uh, we are asking for money to uh, purchase this. When we purchase this, this is the plan, this is the timeline. These are the persons who will be responsible to execute this uh, plan. Uh, the third point is uh, managing short-term trauma. Obviously, for the target entity, it's a very traumatic experience the first few days because uh, uh, you don't know what's happening. You don't know about job security, who will be your new boss, who will be your big boss. So a lot of questions that they have in mind so, and that impacts the work. Uh, the uh, ongoing processes and the operations of the company and you should try to minimize there's no way of avoiding it you have to try and minimize uh, whatever possible uh, to a possible extent uh, so that you can extract the maximum value out of it so uh, managing short-term trauma could be internal as i said employees the middle level managers who's reporting to who and also external uh, you have to give confidence to your customers uh, uh, and uh, you have to give confidence to your suppliers and also you have to keep a watchful eye on your competitors so this is the ideal opportunity all this disruption happening this is the ideal opportunity for competitors to come in and take your customers so soon after the uh, signing we get on call with customers uh, brief them on who we are establish a repo and we just start building that relationship which is essential to hold on to them uh, then comes the implementation. So post, uh, the, when the plan is approved and we, uh, you first manage that first 60-day uh, uh, trauma, then comes the PMI implementation of uh, actually integrating. So we take step by step. Uh, uh, first is the finance functions. We like uh, usually get our uh, finance guy from the acquiring company to sit in a target company and put the processors in, signing rights, who's going to sign what check, uh, what are the processors, who's going to approve what. So all the uh, processors will be built in in the financial process. And also HR, uh, one of our HR partners will go and sit there uh, and listen to all the uh, issues that the target employees have. And we'll do a lot of corrections based on sunshine policies uh, uh, in terms of grading, in terms of salary levels and all that, we do those corrections. And IT, so uh, basically getting those systems up to our standard is the next step. So obviously, this is a very long, long out process. You can't do it overnight. Uh, first, as, as I said, uh, you have to give that initial gap for managing the short term trauma, then go into the BMI implementation. And also, an important part is uh, the monitoring, uh, reporting and monitoring. So, what we do is uh, against the plan, we have to report to our board of directors every quarter and like uh, tell them what what do we uh, what what did we achieve this quarter and the next quarter from the plan as per plan what are you going to achieve? So that commitment is given to the board and there's a quarterly check by the board as to ensure that uh, we uh, uh, get the maximum value out of any acquisition. So that's predominantly. Uh, 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 my, what's in the slide uh, and hope to answer any questions uh, you all have uh, in the Q&A session. Thank you. I think uh, Ruchira, why don't you start with the questions? Yes, uh, thank you for the presentations. Uh, I must thank NDB team as well as Hiran for the presentations uh, that were done on the practical insights or practical aspects of mergers and acquisitions. So a couple of questions have come. So I'll read out the questions. Uh, there's a question on, uh, there's a question that has come in the chat box. Let me open it. It is asking in the present pandemic cli uh, climate, do you think that it's an opportunity for large firms to merge or acquire smaller firms and to increase the market share? So Nilendra, uh, would you decide as to 
from whom should we ask this question or would you take this question? So, I mean, I, I can offer a response there. So naturally, uh, I mean, like I started at the beginning, consolidation of market share is one of the important drivers of MA. And uh, during difficult times, corporates or companies, acquirers who've had the foresight to maintain a tight ship, to have the adequate funding and the capability, and I, I would say the watchest to, to make use of opportune um, uh, times, do make use of it. So clearly, I mean, we've yeah. seen across multiple industries, consolidation of market share happening um, uh, and, and uh, many transactions taking place as a result. Um, so it's a strategy for business growth. That is what you are saying. Definitely, it, definitely. Yeah. So anyone, who, anyone uh, from the team that who wants to add to this? Yeah. So in that, that, yeah. So sorry. in addition, uh, yeah. So in addition to yeah, that's why I at the beginning I said uh, during uh, good times and bad times, both M and A act activities take place. Uh, so in the, in the Sri Lanka market, we are seeing quite a lot of uh, m and consolidation happening in the finance sector. So similarly, uh, there are some other sectors also uh, where consolidation is happening. So yes, uh, it's a, whether it's a good time or bad time, uh, you'll see uh, m and activity taking place. As Nirendra said, uh, those, uh, those with the capacity would be readily available. They'll have the capacity, the strength to go and uh, acquire businesses. Uh, uh, so we have seen a quite a lot of uh, increased activity in the market uh, since of date. Right. Thanks, Darshan. I think so Hiran there's another question. Something. Uh, okay, sorry. Hiran, yeah. you are just going to offer... Uh, yeah, I think just to add to what Darshan said, I think uh, Sunshine is a fine example in that sense. Uh, two of the big acquisitions we did uh, in the public domain, I think you would have read about DNT, the acquisition of DNT and the merger with uh, Akba Healthcare. Uh, both of those transactions was in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, so what happens is, although all this disturbance is there, the overall uh, long-term strategy and ambition doesn't change. The direction is clear. Once you have clarity mm -hmm. on that, it's a matter of executing and being, being more extra careful in terms of DD and understanding those businesses. Okay. So Nilendra, there is another question on, I think, uh, this question is uh, in the area that Rukshan has been talking about on the buying and selling side, uh, reasons for mergers and acquisitions. Now, I think if I understand this question correctly, this person is asking uh, buying and selling sides, buying and selling side reasons for mergers and acquisitions. I mean, he's asking, are those applicable for mergers or are those applicable for acquisitions? Uh, so I would say the clear line between the buy side and sell side essentially is there in an acquisition transaction. So there's a divesting shareholder, there's an acquirer. So the acquirer essentially would be the buy side of the transaction and the divesting mm -hmm. part of the sell side of the transaction. Nevertheless, I mean, even if a, if a merger is to take place, yeah. ultimately, I mean, there are two parties to a merger and there may be a certain shift in balance with a certain party emerging as the dominant uh, stakeholder post integration, post this merger. I mean, there are mergers of equals that happen, but the ultimate reality is at the end of the day, in terms of economic rights, in terms of voting rights, there would be one party that emerges uh, uh, the, the more dominant stakeholder in that combined business. So naturally there again, yes, both parties would be looking at the transaction from a, a different angle and naturally, whether you call it buy side or sell side, apart from that uh, terminology, there would be two perspectives to that transaction. Yeah. Anybody who wants to add to that? Um, technically, we know, I think theoretically, there's a difference between the two terms. There's a difference between the ter two terms, merger as well as the acquisition. So I think the person who has asked the question, he's questioning about whether the Buying side and selling side reasons are applicable in the same way for both both mergers and acquisitions, or are they applying differently for mergers and acquisitions? So, I would say the same strategic to, rationales yeah. and the same reasons do apply whether it's a merger 
or, or an acquisition which leads to a diverse uh, kind of a, a divestiture on the other side. So I think that's why we clubbed this entire uh, MA together because ultimately it's the same reasons that drive this. I think it's the structuring which would uh, determine whether ultimately this is a divestiture to one party and an acquisition to the other party or some mm -hmm. sort of a merger of equals where both parties continue to be engaged and, and be shareholders in a business. Uh, there's another question. Uh, a person is asking as to how it will be helpful after restructuring an entity to grow EPS uh, in terms of risk sharing, good governance, quality of business, and also more despite, I think he's asking about intellectual strategic management. So basically he's asking about how the merger and acquisition would help uh, achieving synergies after an acquisition. Hiran, maybe you want to take that? Uh, sure, sure, Nilay. Uh, so basically, uh, like uh, before the acquisition, we identify what are the synergies are. So sometimes it might be uh, cost synergies, sometimes it might be revenue synergies. Uh, so once you uh, identify those in that uh, investment thesis, the post merge integration plan should incorporate how to extract those synergies. So I'll give you an okay. example. Uh, when we uh, acquired the confectionery companies, one of the synergies we identified is in, on the cost side of the distribution uh, space. So uh, we had a tea distribution uh, operation going. Uh, we had a confectionery distribution operating going. Uh, there was an overlap in terms of uh, the, uh, the shops that they reach. Uh, mm -hmm. So now we are in the process of streamlining that and uh, making it uh, one so that uh, we can get rid of the additional cost as a one company. So that's a- So this is a personal, uh, thank you, Hiran. So this is a personal question, Hiran. Have you come across any company who has resisted a, uh, resisted a merger and acquisition? Uh, there is always somebody, uh, uh, so the, you have to uh, think who the decision maker is. Sometimes uh, the decision making the owner, uh, most of the occasion, but obviously there are other stakeholders involved, like the senior management, employees, uh, and customers, uh, everything. So, uh, in my experience, somebody is not happy because they are right. used to this. Uh, they are used to this uh, outfit. They are used to this way of life, and a merger or acquisition is a disruption of that. Uh, so, somewhere down the line, someone will be unhappy, and we have to manage that. Yes. Also, are, just uh, to add, uh, I mean, yeah. they, are, they are every market, as in every market, Sri Lanka also has had several, I would say, hostile acquisitions in the past. So, uh, I mean, if a buyer is really focused on getting their hands on a certain asset or a certain product or a certain brand, yes, you might, and, and this is mostly in the listed space as well, you might. Mm -hmm embark on a hostile acquisition. So uh, I would say there are lots of risks involved in a hostile acquisition, but nevertheless, it has happened in the past and, and I'm sure it can continue to happen in the future as well. Uh, there's a question on what is the nature of uh, nature of corporate's contemplation of mergers and acquisition with SMBs? So I think if I understand this question correctly, he's asking whether we can see MNAs uh, in SMBs as well. Uh, so, yes, I mean, definitely, I mean, a, a merger or an acquisition can take place irrespective of the size of a business. Just that you need, you need the two intentions and expectations matching each other. So on the one hand, you need to have a, a company where the promoters or the shareholders for various reasons that we mentioned, are willing to let go of a business. And on the other hand, you have someone who, who has the intention to acquire for certain strategic reasons and also the capability from a funding point of view, from a management bandwidth point of view, from a, a skill point of view to kind of uh, take that burden and, and achieve those objectives. So, I mean, I would say it's not only listed corporates that need to do m and I'm sure 
so many things happen below the radar, of course, because it's not large in size, doesn't come into public limelight. Uh, but I think uh, MNA is something that can happen irrespective of the size of an organization. So, Niletra, yeah. what are the main Do reasons why? Yeah, yeah just yeah. to add, actually, uh, uh, say some of these large corporates would have been smaller companies some time back. So they would have actually come, become <laughs> sort of larger conglomerates and larger companies by way of acquiring smaller companies. So as Nilendra said, the size wouldn't matter. It's just that uh, what sort of business growth or expectations that they have, uh, merger synergies, uh, those things probably would uh, be the key ones. It's, it might not be the size actually. And, uh, yeah, thank so you, Darshan. Can, yeah. So oh, there's another question on the post-integration process. Maybe Hiran can answer this question. He's asking, uh, do you think disturbance close to the value chain activities should be considered in the PMI process? Yes, uh, definitely, uh, Chira, because uh, uh, value chain is what we use to get the product out to the customer. Uh, basically, uh, say for example, a consumer company, uh, uh, upstream value chain will be all uh, raw materials coming in. And also the downstream will be the distributor, then the retailer in, ends up in a consumer. Uh, so you have to uh, anticipate uh, all the issues that will come up uh, because uh, it's a step change, right? Like uh, suddenly you've been working with this particular company for 30 years and suddenly you say it is owned by somebody else. Uh, there are a lot of questions, who is this person? Uh, Will these people uh, do business with us, continue to do business with us as yeah. before? Will they value us? So it's a matter of identifying those issues and addressing those issues in a uh, meaningful way. Yeah. There's another question on PMI, uh, Hiran. He is asking exemplary PMIs. What are the examples for very good PMIs in Sri Lanka? Or maybe you can talk about uh, mergers and acquisitions that have failed subsequently. Uh, can you give us some examples? Uh, I'm not too sure about the other examples, Ujira, but I can speak about this, my personal examples at Sunshine. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't categorize anything as exemplary because uh, yeah. nothing goes according to plan. It's uh, all about yeah. having Absolutely. a plan and then uh, thinking on your feet and adjusting the plan accordingly. Because every situation is different and issues come up on a hourly basis, especially in that uh, traumatic uh, period of like first two weeks to a month. So uh, it's a matter of uh, managing those in a meaningful way. Uh, uh, I think Darshan and, uh, Darshan and Ilendra may be able to shed some light on uh, successful, unsuccessful PMNs. It's See, not uh, it, 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 all, it depends. It depends on what your time frame is, because there have been examples of acquisitions which may have been near failures in the immediate aftermath, but with the right team coming in, with the right skill set, expertise, these have been turned around, and in hindsight, looking back, I mean, it's 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 extremely successful. Mm -hmm. Similarly, there may have been uh, transactions that are on day one looking, you know, really good, but because of certain lack of oversight or certain uh, uh, wrong movements, uh, you know, in, in the overall integration process, they may have over a period of time really, you know, proved to be worthless completely. So I, I suppose it's, it, it matters, you know, uh, depending on the time frame that you look at as well. But yes, there are examples on both sides. I, I, yeah, just to add, actually, uh, I don't want to mention the name, but there was a leisure sector company where we did the transaction, and uh, the, the the buyers actually uh, they were happy that they were, they sort of bought it into that, but then uh, subsequently a, a year down the line, uh, the promoters actually uh, went and uh, opened another sort of a leisure sector uh, entity where they were competing. So that's when the non-competing clauses come uh, into being and it's very important because we are, sometimes we have seen the, the, the sellers selling their operations and then uh, and then again engaging in the same business, approaching the customers, uh, their contacts, all that. And then the, as a result, uh, the, the, the actual uh, the, the, the acquisition can be a failure from the buyer's point of view. 
So those things that we have seen. So those are some of the things as uh, Rukshan said. Those are some of the things that needs to be structured properly, brought into the agreements, legal agreements, in a way that things like this wouldn't happen. So that's just one, yes, one example. Yeah. Yeah. So this question is about share purchase agreement. This uh, person is asking, how can we have a share purchase agreement to have earn out mechanisms? Uh, Rukshan, do you want to take that? Uh... Yeah, sure. So, uh, so essentially in the share purchase agreement, uh, uh, everything will be kind of lined out in terms of uh, how this earn out mechanism would take place. Say if I take an example, again, let me take the 70-30 example. Uh, say a particular minority shareholder has a 30% stake and for that stake uh, we are looking at maybe a performance base uh, multiple or so on so say if, hypothetically it's a it's a profit multiple and net profit multiple and price you earnings, have yeah. yeah so surprise so earnings multiple and uh, it's let's say eight times of price to earnings so that's the valuation that you'll oh. be buying uh, your shares will be bought at in the future. And also another aspect of this is where... Ruksha, now, sorry to interrupt, is that kind of a benchmark, eight times the price earnings multiple? No, not at all, not at all. So it, it'll depend on the industry and of course the negotiation abilities as well. So eight times was just an example. So it's not a benchmark. Uh, I won't say it is, it's a benchmark. Yeah. So all that so would be essentially lined out in a share purchase agreement. And yeah. uh, there'll be a clear process outlined as to how that exit would happen. And if there are any additional payments or any additional compensations that need to happen as part of this, everything will be clearly lined out. And this is where the legal teams also get involved. So yes. our experience uh, working with uh, legal teams as well, they'll be extremely thorough with it and from both sides. So there won't be anything that is left in like a gray area once right. the uh, share purchase agreement is signed. Yes. So very brief, Nilendra, maybe you can answer this question. What are the key aspects to uh, look out for in the DD process? Uh, so I'll, 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 before I give a generic example, a qualifying statement, it all depends on the industry. Say, for example, if it's a financial services industry, uh, uh, NBFI, we are seeing a lot of m &A activity right now. I mean, if you're buying a non-bank financing entity, then maybe you focus a lot on loan book, on provisioning, on collection ratios, on, on um, uh, systems, how accurate they are, uh, any, any errors. Uh, whereas if you're looking at a manufacturing organization, you'd be more concerned about doing technical audits on the manufacturing capacity, the, the vintage of the machinery, are they about to you know, collapse or significant capex or maintenance capex expected shortly. Uh, I mean, if it's a if it's a food and beverage industry, consumer facing one, uh, you need to make sure that the recipes, the the know how of the organization is documented and it's it's in a safe and secure place. If you're buying a, a technology platform. You need to make sure that the source code is unadulterated. It's it's what is given to you is what is really out there. So depending on the kind of sector, typically you will have uh, varying elements of focus. But generally speaking, you would have what is known as a financial due diligence, looking at the balance sheet, contingent liabilities, um, uh, PNL, seeing if all the costs are accurately reflected, if the total revenue potential of the company is reflected, or is it understated, overstated? So that's a financial aspect. Then there would be a tax aspect. Have tax and all statutory payments been paid on time? Uh, it can be taxation, corporate taxation, VAT, ESC, employee taxes, all of that. And then there can be a charge due diligence. Again, it depends on if employees are a critical part of what you're buying goes back to the question, what are you really buying? Uh, if the team is something critical, then you better do your HR due diligence and make sure, uh, you know, the skill sets that you think they have uh, really can, you know, be uh, integrated and fitted into your plans. Uh, and of course, uh, in telco, in IT industries, technical due diligence, and even in manufacturing industries, wherever significant plant and machinery is involved. So it'll, it'll depend uh, that element the degree of focus will depend on 
which particular industry you are in. Okay, thank you, Nirendra. So maybe I will end the session with this question. It is asking about the possible mergers and acquisitions to be done in rural area in the northern province. I don't know whether you can answer this question. Uh, this question has come from the audience. Uh, it's asking about the possible mergers and acquisitions to be done in the northern province. Yeah, Anybody willing so to take, take up? Yeah. yeah, sure. That uh, that's an, maybe I'll, I'll so see an M and A transaction is driven. This is not like uh, direct investments or capex. This is about trying to achieve something strategic to the organization's goals. So, if an organization wants to uh, get access to a certain resource which is out there, or uh, labor pool. We have seen certain manufacturing companies moving towards the eastern province, the northern province, especially the apparel industry, because there is, uh, you know, labor pool uh, availability of uh, ample availability of uh, uh, employees out there. That may trigger a transaction of that nature. So ultimately, it's about if you're focusing on a particular region, in this case, say northern province, does that region have specifically what you're looking for? Like I said, it may be a labor pool, it may be a natural resource, uh, mining rights to that natural resource, or something that is unique in that area which would attract private capital uh, into that area can trigger M&A activity. Uh, Darshan, you want to add anything on top of that? Uh, yeah, so at the same time, maybe a uh, healthcare sector. So say, so, uh, say, uh, a chain here would want to sort of uh, look at expanding into the northern territory or eastern. So there can be a lot of uh, people there who would want health services. Or probably uh, so there can be uh, satellite hospitals uh, doing well. So there can be. So it's that as an said, it all depends on the the, the resources. So there it's that uh, uh, not that it's uh, just because it's not another province that uh, things wouldn't happen. Uh, so it's all, it all depends on the re availability of resources and then the, the, the requirement from this end, uh, say someone from uh, outside the northern province to go and uh, set up uh, businesses uh, and acquire businesses. Like uh, Direna said, uh, the apparel sector is a good example where people like MAs and all have gone and set up uh, operations there, mainly because of the resource pool there. So it can it would have probably uh, uh, not in the case of MAs, but maybe there would have been uh, some other party who would want who would have wanted to uh, acquire uh, 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 textile uh, operation there, uh, sort of apparel company, garment factory there. So it it doesn't limit uh, the geographically. I think it all depends on the uh, availability of resources. Yeah, and and a quick uh, comment and addition to that, the northern consumer itself, because in certain segments you may see very strong localized brands uh, and and where where brands from colombo can't really penetrate so these uh, particular brands or brand owning companies on the consumer side might be uh, an interesting kind of acquisition target as well uh, of course depending on the potential uh, of the consumer spending and, and, and all of those factors taken into consideration uh, Nilayana, something to that. Yeah, there is a question from Mr. Kulatunga Rajapaksha. I'm sorry, I had to ask this question. He's asking, if we are acquiring a company with accumulated losses, can we set off those losses against the profits and vice versa? Maybe if, uh, from the taxation perspective. Uh, so I'll, I'll start by saying that we are uh, not tax consultants and, and not qualified to answer that, but nevertheless, based on transaction experience. So the the accumulated losses of a particular entity, if the entity's shares are acquired by another company, the accumulated losses of that particular target stay within that. However, that gives you a natural tax shield, meaning which when you turn around the business and, and, and uh, you start generating profits, naturally, if there are carry forward tax losses, which can be utilized, uh, you would be essentially enjoying uh, certain tax savings on that. Uh, so naturally that benefit is there, but I'll, I'll stop my comments at that because uh, I'm, I'm no tax expert. Anybody uh, else would want to answer that? Yeah, of course. Uh, so with the accumulated losses, actually sometimes those things are priced because of the 
the ability to set off for future profits, uh, those uh, the, the equivalent losses are price. So in addition to the business uh, businesses assets and liabilities, so there can be so there can be value for uh, for equivalent losses as well as the Nina said. So um, yeah, so uh, yeah. Uh, as uh, so, it all depends on because there are certain uh, uh, time frames that you can carry forward losses. So, subject right. to those things, subject to those things, uh, these can be valued. And uh, in fact, certain buyers actually come and buy companies uh, mainly to uh, get the tax benefit. Excellent. Yeah. So, uh, many activity happen as a result of uh, equivalent losses being there in some of the target companies. Correct. Right. So thank you, thank you for the entire panel. Professor, I would like to end the Q&A session now. So let me now invite uh, Vice President of CMA Sri Lanka and Vice President of South Asian Federation of Accountants, Mr. Hennaika Bandara to give the vote of thanks. Uh, thank you, Rajine. Uh, Good speakers and ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of CMA and, be, and being a banker who had a very good business relationship with NDB Investment Bank maybe a couple of years ago, I'm glad to propose this word of thanks after a very successful seminar and discussion conducted by the experts in the industry about strategic, strategic manage, mergers and acquisitions for business growth and important topic. With that note, first I would like to thank the senior management team of the NDB the Investment Bank, Mr. Darshan Perra, Director, CEO, Mr. Lilendra Veerasinghe, Mr. Rukshan Apalsu for your insightful presentation and sharing your experiences to educate all participants on the subject matter. And we appreciate the support extended to our institute, CMA. Let me also thank Mr. Hiran Samarasinghe, Head of Investor Relations and Strategy of Sunshine Group for technical inputs and expertise provided we appreciate your time and wealth of knowledge shared with us. I'm sure that the guidance provided and technical matters highlighted by them will assist all of you to enhance your knowledge and skills. I also thank our president, Professor Lakshmar Watavala, for organizing this seminar under the CPD program to improve the knowledge of our members and others. Finally, I would like to thank Mr. Ruchira Perra all of the council members, members of the institute, members of staff and member bodies, and others for your participation and the CMA team for the support extended to conduct this event. Thank you all. Take care, stay safe. Good night to all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Darshan. I think uh, it was a great uh, event. I must thank you and your team. Uh, for the very, very excellent uh, presentation that was done and the questions raised really showed uh, uh, the uh, great importance of this. And uh, uh, once again, let me thank you. And I'm sure that our relationship will continue and maybe in the future uh, that we will be able to have another one because there were many questions, but I'm sorry that uh, we will not be able to answer all the questions, but I'm sure a majority of them were questioned. And thanks very much for your uh, very good presentations and also taking up the questions, uh, Darshan. Would you like to say something at the end, Darshan? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for giving us the opportunity. NDB as a bank, uh, get another opportunity to work with CMA uh, Sri Lanka. So we would be more than happy to uh, partner CMA Sri Lanka and uh, and to participate in uh, uh, forums like this in the best interest of the the, the membership and the public. Uh, we also actually knowledge based uh, institution. So we have been uh, sort of uh, recruiting a uh, lot of undergraduates from all these universities, both uh, mainly from local as well as uh, foreign. So we are a knowledge based institution. We would like to partner knowledge wherever possible and partner uh, organizations like CMA Sri Lanka and do that. Uh, I know you have been doing a lot of uh, programs to educate your membership. So we would be happy to partner you in uh, in the future as well, uh, Professor. Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity. And I uh, would like to thank uh, Hiran and my, and, and my team and uh, Ruchira and Sahir Nagwandara uh, for everything. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Darshan. Uh, maybe Ruchira, you can say final words and we can close it. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Darshan. And also thank you very much for your team for the excellent presentation and also uh, for facilitating the questions raised by the audience. So thank you very much once again uh, for grace in this occasion and uh, giving us knowledge, giving us practical insights about mergers and acquisitions. Thank you very much.
thank you everyone okay. thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you all thank you thank you sir thank you all good night thanks sir darshan and the team okay bye thank you thanks mr karmaratna i think mr gajendra also there thank you very much uh, thanks and i thank you right okay we will we'll wind up okay